Welcome to the Che Institute Scientific in Innovation Series. Today, in the ninth iteration of the series, we focus on the metaverse and digital realities. I am Yong Tae Hong, a professor of electrical and computer engineering at the Seoul National University. I'm particularly excited to moderate today's webinar with the leading experts and scholars on the metaverse, which is a buzzword that has especially gained momentum during the online everything shift of the pandemic. Today, we have Dr. Michael Kass and Dr. Douglas Lenman joining us from the United States. And we have Professor Byung-ho Lee and Professor Un Tae Wu joining us from Korea. Now, I will introduce you to our opening plenary speaker. Dr. Michael Kass is a senior distinguished engineer at NVIDIA and the overall software architect of NVIDIA Omniverse, which is NVIDIA's platform and the pipeline for collaborative 3D content creation based on USD. He is also the recipient of distinguished awards, including the 2005 Scientific and Technical Academy Award and the 2009 SIGGRAPH Computer Graphics Achievement Award. Today, his talk title is Plumbing the Metaverse with USD. Dr. Kass, please. So my name is Michael Kass. Uh, I'm a distinguished engineer from NVIDIA. And today we're we'll talking about uh, NVIDIA's view of the metaverse and how we need an open metaverse and that we believe that the uh, core of that metaverse should be USD, Pixar's universal theme description. Now, I don't think I have to really do much to introduce the metaverse to this, um, to this group, but the original name goes back to Neil Stevenson's novel Snow Crash in 1992. And uh, the original idea probably goes back further. And the metaverse is about coming together, uh, people coming together inside of a virtual space. It can be for a variety of different purposes. It could be for entertainment. Uh, it could be for collaboration. It could be for community. It could be to get practical things done. The idea of the metaverse is such a big idea that it's not possible for one company or one organization to control it all. So we're confident that there will be multiple metaverses in the future. Some of them will be very specialized. But in addition to whatever specialized metaverses end up uh, being created in the future, we think it's critical that there be at least one open metaverse. That is a metaverse based on open standards to which anybody can uh, connect and over which no single interest individual organization has control. So what would that look like and how would we get there? We think that uh, the path to the metaverse is really, uh, to the open metaverse, is really much like the path to creating a true 3D web. What would that involve and what does that mean? Well, we need to adopt an open, powerful, expressive 3D scene description. We need to make it possible to connect to that description uh, from a wide variety of sources. And we need to make sure that every piece of that is based on open source technology. So people have spent a lot of time, people have spent decades trying to bring 3D into our current web. The efforts go back as far as 1994 with Vermal, virtual reality modeling language. Uh, in 2001, we had X3D. In 2015, GLTF. Then in 2019, WebVR. WebXR, and in 2020, WebGPU. Now, all these efforts have been uh, important and influential and pushed forward the idea of 3D in the web. But we believe that um, they're never gonna really get us where we want to on the time scale that we want um, in order to form a true 3D web. And why is that? Because these are incremental improvements in a system where 2D is really at the core and 3D is being added. We believe that's backwards. So 
in order to create a true open metaverse that anybody can connect to, we think there are four differences in approach that we have to take versus the kind of efforts that I mentioned that were going on in the past. First of all, we need to start with the right 3D representation. So in the past, we started with the web as it was and tried to add to it. And at the center of the web is, is HTML. But really, 3D is much, much harder than 2D. So what you really want to do is start with 3D and embed 2D inside, because the complexity is much, much greater on the 3D side. Now, given that complexity and given the size and um, subtlety of those models, we think it's critical that the 3D representation has to be incremental at its core. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, when a web page changes, you can, generally speaking, resend the whole page if necessary. The amount of data is just not that great. And so you see a lot of situations where web pages just refresh entirely, no matter you know, what it is that, that has been modified. This can work in 2D. It has no chance in 3D. Because in 3D, the amount of shared data that describes a scene could be hundreds of megabytes. It could be gigabytes. And there's just no way that you can retransmit all of that um, in an effective way every time something changes. So whatever we want at the core of a true 3D web needs to be incremental. It needs to be that I send you a representation and then I can send you changes, any number of changes so that we can keep up to date without having to start from scratch. And fundamentally, HTML and most other web uh, technologies at the center of the 2D web are not uh, incremental, fully incremental in this way, where you can just modify anything you want little by little. A third direction we think is really important to create an effective 3D web is to pay attention to high-end hardware. The tendency in the web these days has been to try to make sure that everything looks the same everywhere. And that requires basically going down to the least common denominator of hardware. And there are good reasons to want to do that. The best of which is to try to make sure that whatever the content is, is universally, uh, universally, universally accessible. And we think that's a laudable goal. But today, it's possible relatively inexpensively to do remote rendering. You don't have to do all the rendering on the client. A single uh, server on a typical cloud platform these days costs less than a dollar per hour. And that server is potentially capable of, of uh, providing a service to many different users. So the cost of doing it in a remote location, either on the edge or in a data center, is really not that prohibitive. And so we think it's important to target where we want to be and uh, allow that rendering to happen in the data center if it needs to now, and then over time, it could migrate uh, to the client. The next thing we think is really important is to make sure that, that um, whatever that representation is, that it supports offering at all times. Now, most of us are familiar with game engines, which tend to uh, have a baking step. They um, want to make sure that everything runs as fast as possible. They take the representation of the world that was used for creating it, and they boil it down, they bake it into something which is optimized for performance. Uh, obviously, there are reasons to do optimizations, and this is, this is very critical, but we think that the kinds of um, experiences that we'll have in the uh, open metaverse are gonna be very varied and not just limited in the way that uh, many of today's games are. And in order to make anything to keep open the possibilities and make anything uh, still potentially achievable, we think it's important to maintain the kind of representation that you want for authoring and be able to swap in and out that representation as needed for any part that could potentially um, be desired to change. Okay, so if we're going to achieve this, if we're going to build 
an open metaverse based on the kind of ideas that I mentioned. We need a common representation of the virtual world and one which is, is complex, one that's powerful, one that's extensible. And we think that representation already exists. We think that representation is USD, the universal scene description that was developed by Pixar and uh, very kindly of them open source to the entire community. So Pixar developed USD to meet the, name, the needs of their own computer graphics productions. And it evolved over the course of many of their films and has uh, a very long list of features which I won't go through individually, but which are sufficient for the complexity of the world that they've created. And I think most of us would agree that if an open metaverse can come close to that complexity, it would be delightful. So from that point of view, um, it's, it's really very, very appropriate. Now, uh, I wanna, want people to understand basically how USD works and at its foundation, it describes the world as a set of properties and then values for those properties. And then collections of properties together represent higher level objects. In addition, it puts those collections of, of properties and values onto um, a set of layers. And by dividing those properties into layers, it enables, uh, from Pixar's view, it was an important enabler of collaboration for large teams. But um, for an open metaverse, it's exactly what you want so that different parts of the world can be modified simultaneously by different actors or by different services uh, or by different portions of the metaverse. So what is it about USD that, that um, makes us believe it's the right solution? Um, it begins with a set of schemas. So these schemas can, for example, uh, describe geometry, cameras, lights, even simple rigging for, for um, uh, characters. And it allows you to describe relationships among objects. Uh, it'll, very importantly, it, it includes inheritance. So you can create classes inside of USD. So for example, you could um, build a class to describe uh, trees. You could build a class to describe a certain kind of trees like pine trees that you might find in a certain forest. You could um, then have another class to describe rigid objects. And then you might have a particular tree which would inherit certain things from the fact that it's just a, you know, a tree at all, other properties from being a pine trees, and then have specializations on top of that that are due to um, where it is specifically in the world or what its purpose is and uh, its unique properties. These are the kinds of things that are very important to um, make it flexible for creating content. You wanna be able to make changes in one place that affect a lot of different things together based on what their relationships are. USD is also able to scale very well to, to quite large data sets. So it includes features for lazy loading, it includes different uh, variants of the same object or same asset, which can be used for level of detail and a variety of other purposes. It is very nicely extensible. So you can add new schemas, you can add new input output formats um, and a uh, variety of other ways that you can extend, uh, extend the library itself. One of the very key properties that it has is that it's based on layering. And this is uh, really important to maintain the ability to um, uh, author things with the full richness that you want in an authoring representation. These layers are um, in some ways analogous to layers in Photoshop. So basically each layer has a collection of properties and uh, values for those properties that are referred to as opinions. And the layers are in a stack in terms of um, of their strength. And the strength, the, the uh, strongest layer wins out for the value of a property. And these layers are all composed together dynamically to give you the final result. So different people can control things on different uh, layers. 
uh, and you can composite different objects together from a variety of different sources. So USD has most of the things we think are necessary for um, the basis of an open metaverse. There are a few things that are missing and we've been working hard to try to fill those missing holes. One thing that uh, has been missing from USD as it was originally distributed by Pixar is that it was designed for their purposes, which are uh, primarily not interactive. Their main purpose was to facilitate film development. And so we've done a lot of work in, with uh, USD to make it support very fast updates. And we've man managed to uh, get the speed of those updates to the point where we have been able to base our uh, autonomous driving simulator on uh, a USD core. The other thing is that I mentioned that there was a requirement, I think, for um, the foundation of an open metaverse to be incremental. And so we built a library on top of the USD library where you can do anything you want through the USD API. You can create objects, you can create relationships, you can create um, lights and meshes and move them around and do whatever it is that you want. And it keeps a record essentially of what has changed. And so at any point, you can ask it to synchronize to uh, a central database server or another user and construct the difference between what used to be and what is now. And that's the thing that's required at its core for whatever representation we want to be um, the shared representation of, a, of an open metaverse. The next thing that USD doesn't deal with uh, out of the box is materials. And in part, that's because Pixar uh, didn't want to force any particular material choice on anybody. So we've done work uh, with a material library developed at NVIDIA called MDL, which we've open sourced. And we spent a lot of time making sure that there's a very good integration between the MDL library, um, uh, allowing it to provide very high quality materials as you see here in this picture. Um, and for those to be fully interchangeable, fully open, available to all. USD itself is pretty much entirely declarative. So uh, it states that, you know, there's this kind of object, it has this property, it lives over here, but there's very little in USD that defines behavior. So we've been developing a, um, procedural modeling tool called Omnigraph, which is layered on top of USD and makes it possible to uh, specify procedural generation of geometry or um, procedural behavior. And lastly, USD does not include any way uh, natively to specify physical simulation. So we have open sourced PhysX, the NVIDIA uh, physical simulator, which is used in, in, in many, many games, many game engines. We've open sourced it and we've done an integration with USD. And we've worked with Apple and Pixar to specify in USD the required physical parameters so that we can create a realistic virtual world uh, in a way which is universally understandable. So with these tools, with USD at the center, how do we create an open metaverse? What does it look like? Well, at a center is gonna be some kind of database. On the edge, there are different ways to connect into it. You'll have a variety of different client applications. On the other end, you will have a variety of different ways to experience the content. You wanna be able to experience it in AR, in VR, uh, from a desktop, in whatever the best way to connect to this virtual world is for a particular person. And to enable the kinds of experiences that we want, we want, we want to have a variety of different technologies that connect in. So if we try to dig a little bit deeper, we, I can show you now our implementation of these ideas, which is inside of what we call NVIDIA's Omniverse. So we've built a central server, a database server, we call the nucleus server. 
And the Nucleus server is the uh, one standard of truth. It uh, describes the entire metaverse virtual world in USD. It operates by a publish and subscribe mechanism. So every different piece of USD, every layer is independently published and subscribed to inside of the Nucleus server. And we've built bi-directional connectors to a variety of different um, client applications, which you can see on the left from um, Maya, Max, Blender, Unreal, Revit, et cetera, et cetera, which allow those applications to synchronize their internal representation with the Nucleus server by sending only what changes back and forth. We've created a framework where we can provide services to, what, to the virtual world on the Nucleus server, uh, microservices that could do uh, format conversions if necessary, search for different kinds of applications, uh, do offline rendering, uh, levels of detail, a variety of different uh, services that you could imagine. And then we have uh, processes which can look at the virtual world, subscribe to it, and uh, render the results, either uh, to a workstation, to VR, to AR, um, into a web browser, whatever the, is appropriate for a given user. So how does this work if you have a, an existing client application? What we've typically done is we've taken a legacy application have their own scene graph. And we've introduced plugins. So in the plugin, we bring in the USD library and we try to mirror between the USD library and the internal representation of the application. So typically uh, these applications have APIs that allow us to be notified when something happens to the scene graph. For example, somebody hits some button in the user interface and creates something. When that happens, we create the same object, the corresponding object in the USD library. And we also go the way the other direction. If there's a change to the USD library, we then mirror it into the scene graph of the client application. Now, on top of the USD library, we have something we call the Omniverse Connect library. And that allows the application to connect into one of these uh, Nucleus database servers and create uh, subscriptions and publish various things. And inside of that library is this uh, technology that I mentioned that keeps track of what's changed and only sends the differences. So what happens is when everything is connected live, somebody in application one uh, can hit a button, can move something, can make any change that they want, changes in their scene graph, that changes to the USD the library inside of the plugin in that application. That then uh, gets published as a diff to the Nucleus server. Those changes then get broadcast to all of the applications that subscribe, then for example, in client application two, um, the Omniverse Connect library would send an update to the USD library, make the appropriate changes, and those changes would be mirrored into the scene graph of the second application. So here I'm gonna show you uh, the Omniverse at work where everything is being synchronized with USD. Um, we have three applications. Uh, on, on the left, we have Unreal, we have Substance, and we have Maya. And then on the right, we have Universe Create doing real-time uh, path tracing using RTX. So here you see the users simultaneously making updates. The Maya user at the bottom is doing modeling, which plays to Maya's strength. The substance user in the middle is uh, painting textures. You see those live updated on the right. And then at the top left, you have uh, Unreal being used for layout. And notice that they're not seeing necessarily all the same things. So the uh, Maya user is only working on one particular um, one particular asset, that table, and um, all the other pieces are being uh, put together. So you can, you can subscribe to just a piece 
or to uh, the entirety of NEC. And we believe that a true 3D web shouldn't really be reduced to the least common denominator. And, and what's convinced us is that we've been very successful at doing remote rendering. And I'm gonna show this to you uh, in, in a moment where we can um, render from this nucleus database and stream it to uh, a mobile device. We can stream it, stream it to a web page. We can stream it to XR. Uh, whether it's VR or, or AR. And by doing that, it allows us to really um, uh, have a lot of freedom and see quite high quality as we venture into uh, virtual experiences which can be shared and be part of the real world or, or completely independent of it. So here's a, an example where we've created this virtual world on the moon. Uh, and it's being driven at the moment by AI pose estimation. So we have a camera looking at this user, the camera's cre uh, creating a skeleton. That skeleton is being described in USD. It's being published to the nucleus server. It's then being used to uh, drive this model of the of the uh, astronaut. And now we see somebody with a tablet seeing the same virtual scene. Uses a, a camera and AR. So we're using AR kit to export uh, a camera there. And you may have noticed quickly went by there was there's somebody at the desktop. He's actually moving a flag around. We have all these users interacting with the same scene at the same time. And here we take it a little bit further. Okay, so those people are actually physically in the same room with each other. This works just as well as people are far away. Here we have one user in St. Louis, we have one user in Santa Clara. And now they have uh, motion suits on, excellent motion suits for uh, inertial motion capture. And even though they're in completely different uh, uh, places, they're able to be part of the same scene. They see each other and um, they can speak to each other. They can interact. Obviously they could be fully in, in VR suits if they wanted to, but we have a, a wide variety of, of, uh, of different options here. So, Here's another um, scene where you're gonna see the power of uh, the universal representation. We've uh, taken a scene described in USD. We're path tracing it in real time. We've created uh, parameters in the USD that describe the physical properties. We've now brought in a VR user. He's represented by this avatar. And he can interact freely with this three-dimensional virtual world as if it were real. Knocking it around. And you'll see uh, in a moment, he uh, will we'll take a, a nice little walking horse, come up to it, play around with it as if it's a, a real physical device, real physical um, entity. And we've completely standardized the representation of the physical properties and uh, provided an open source simulator that can be used as part of anybody's simulation of a metaverse. As I mentioned, USD represents things in layers um, and those layers can be independent and composited on top of each other in, as 3D properties. And this is just one example of how you can use this uh, composition to build up a character. You can start with an initial sculpt, for example, done in ZBrush. 
You can add props on another layer that were created, for example, in 3D Studio Max. You can add lighting to the scene um, using, for example, Omniverse Create, which is our Omniverse native application. You can add materials to it on a um, separate layer, for example, using Adobe Substance. And uh, you can put it in the scene, and the scene can be built up of different pieces that came from all kinds of different places as well. Each of these layers is addressed by a URL. So none of these things need to be local. They can come from anywhere, just like on the 2D web. And just as you can create 2D uh, web pages that bring in pieces from all over the internet, you can do the same here. Uh, with the nuclear server and with our uh, view of the of the open metaverse. So our idea here is um, to put USD at the center to help and extend USD in as much of a standardized way as we can to base it all on open standards so nobody has to be afraid that their data will be captive or that they'll be uh, at somebody else's uh, mercy. And uh, in doing so, we think that uh, we can drive a path where everybody comes together around an adequate collection of open standards that allow a, a rich, very rich variety of experiences that go far beyond gaming um, far beyond uh, some of the more restricted applications that many people have talked about um, and do things which are, which are useful for, for industry, that are practical for getting real work done, and that also provide uh, the ability to create community and, um, and real deep, important human interactions. So we invite people to uh, look at USD to come and tell us what they think uh, needs. Uh, it needs to, to cover their needs as well and try to help standardize that and, and make that uh, an open addition to the USD ecosystem. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kass, for pointing out the importance of open standards and providing a comprehensive overview of how USD can be extended to meet the need of an open metaverse. Now, I will introduce our second plenary speaker. Dr. Douglas Lemman is the director of Display Systems Research at Facebook Reality Labs, where he leads investigations into advanced display and imaging technologies for augmented and virtual reality. His prior research has focused on head-mounted displays glasses-free 3D displays, light field cameras, and active illumination for 3D reconstruction and interaction. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so again, my name is Douglas Landman and I'm coming to you from Facebook Reality Labs. For the last 10 years of my career, I've, I've had a singular focus, which is in a sense uh, to create the ultimate display, at least the ultimate display within my lifetime. and and. What I mean by that is something that is as immersive, as realistic as the human visual system is able to perceive. And so for the last seven years of this mission, I've been joined by a team I now lead uh, at FRL called Display Systems Research. And our goal you know, in creating this ultimate display is so that we can experience anything visual, right? Anything captured from the real world or created synthetically with the, the full fidelity possible. And so for those of you in the audience, I encourage you to think about the question I ask every member from an intern to a, a very experienced professor who joins my team, what is the ultimate display, right? So we're talking about the metaverse at this event. Ultimately, the output matters, right? How do we view this, right? Is, is it a tablet? Is it a cell phone? All of these things exist and have value. But what drives me in my career is to find the ultimate display, the one that is most compatible with the human visual system. And so Ivan Sutherland actually launched us, many of us on the, on the path we are on with AR and VR. His answer in 1965, a very short memo I recommend you all read, 
Uh, I'm just going to read an excerpt here. He found that the ultimate display would, of course, be a room within which the computer could control the existence of matter itself, right? So <laughs> he aimed high from the very beginning, control matter in its full generality. A chair in such a room would be good enough to sit in. Handcuffs in such a room would be confining. A bullet displayed in such a room would be fatal. And with appropriate programming, such a display could literally be the wonderland into which Alice walked. This is not the metaverse we speak of at the moment, right? The metaverse we speak of is a digital representation where our embodiment is primarily audio visual with some light haptics. The degree of haptics Ivan imagines is beyond the reach potentially of our lifetime. And so Ivan took a step back as we all are even decades later and tried to imagine what would be the ultimate display. And so in 1965, he essentially built what we're still working on, the first head-mounted display. And so it's interesting that his thought experiment naturally led to a room. To control matter itself, you probably need a lot of an infrastructure, but to control photons, even in 1965, Ivan did not truly need a room. He needed a room for the compute and the tracking system, but he only needed a head-mounted display. So here it is, the world's first full six-off tracked uh, head mounted display. And so, yeah, it's a room, but it's not a room. It's just a headset. And so I think that's telling that to create something that could deliver the full six stop fidelity of the human visual system, Ivan actually did begin with a headset. And it makes some sense that if you are trying to create a stereoscopic display, one display per eye placed close to the eye is sort of the logical first architecture you could imagine that could work. But we took a detour for a very long time in our field. You know, the primary academic community I publish in is SIGGRAPH. And when I began my career more than 10 years ago, the state-of-the-art virtual reality systems were Ivan's rooms, cave virtual environments. Shutter glasses combined with high-end projectors would make the most immersive display you could possibly experience 20 or 30 years ago. But it's still a room. How many rooms are we going to have in our world of the future I think this vision of a, of a cave is not compatible with where computing evolved. It's personal, it's portable, it's not infrastructure heavy. Not all of us have the square footage to even create such a room, but we still want what Ivan wanted. We want a display that can, we can experience anything on, at least anything visual. And so that leads to really what's driving my career and my team. We step back and we say, what can we do to pass the visual Turing test? all the way from capture through rendering, transmission, compression, reconstruction, and ultimately display, end to end what is necessary to make and recreate reality accurately for the human visual system. That's the goal. How do we get there? Well, first, let's take a step back. Where are we at? How close are we to creating the ultimate display? Well, those of you in the audience have a major role in creating the displays of the world. Since 1965, by my estimate, this is what we got. Everything from cinema through televisions, monitors, laptops, tablets, phones, and now wearables. This is the ultimate destiny of all computer graphics. It's gonna be displayed on one of these two dimensional surfaces. I think this is really what drives me in my career. I grew up playing video games. I'm very passionate about interactive storytelling. A flat two dimensional canvas is not what humans are ultimately built for we view a stereoscopic world that is much wider, brighter, higher contrast, and more immersive than any of these devices. But the world does want these things, and it's for a good reason. When I was just beginning high school, every computer, for the most part, was a desktop at best. And portability became the driving factor of display technology over the last 30 years. And also being personal. We no longer share our mainframes with everyone. We have a personal computer that is portable and that's what won out. But in the process, we gave up, for those of us who care about computer graphics, nearly everything. We gave up immersion. Of course, we'd love to have a portable cinema screen, but how could you build such a thing? A cave is not, not intrinsically portable. And so we've had to trade off portability for, and, and personalization for immersion. This is really, I think, in some sense, the best expression. I couldn't say it 10 years ago, but this is why I started working on displays. It's, computer graphics wasn't the problem, it was the output device. So let's go to the left, let's look at immersion. The devices we have are generally cinema. All of us have experienced cinema. Even those of us working in technology, very small percentages have actually experienced a good VR cave. 
And until very recently, almost no one had experienced VR. And hopefully now you can get why, at least in my lifetime, I think the answer of what is the ultimate display has to be a wearable display. And here's why is there's a singularity all the way to the left here. All of a sudden, when we go past a cave to a VR headset, we have something very bizarre happen where we loop around and we have a portable and personal device again, right? It's not a shared mainframe. It's not a heavy installation device. It's something I can take anywhere and experience anything with. And it's personal, which as a display engineer means every photon I create can be directed to your retina. No wasted light uh, in theory. And the other magic trick is even compared to a cave, I think this has the real chance of realism. By having a controlled lighting environment, good sixed off tracking, we can hope to reach things we've never achieved in displays, faithful dynamic range to reality, wide color gamuts, retinal resolution across the full human field of view. This is why at least to the left, certainly VR and AR is the most immersive display we'll experience in our lifetime. But then going back on the right, something special also happens that if you think about AR, AR is both personal and portable. So we can do all the things we want as a display engineer. Every photon, once again, can fill our vision. Now we can go to a coffee shop and have an immersive desktop system and not be forced to work on small tablets or small laptops. Clearly, clearly this sort of defines the endpoints of displays, at least as I see it. And then the last part, the Turing test. Because we have a stereoscopic display on both ends of the spectrum, we can actually achieve true visual realism. So there you have it. I don't think this will change. The story is sort of set, at least for my career. AR, VR are the ultimate displays. So the question now is just, what do we work on? What are the actual key challenges? And I think in some sense, starting to begin another 10 years of my career, I don't think we should do things like this, to be honest. You know, early in my career, I'd look at one individual thing at a time. How do we get high dynamic range? How do we get a small form factor? Over this talk, I'll share some recent work from my team that tries to push the dimensions of the visual experience in AR and VR, but jointly. It's, it's not enough to find one magic trick. You have to find them all together to make a better display system that pulls all the visual axes forward. So a better way to start on research is from first principles. Where are we at? If you buy my story so far, VR is the ultimate display at the moment. So what's wrong with it or what limits it? Well, it's obvious, take it out of the box, weigh it. It's around 500 grams. Obviously we'd like that to be sub hundred grams to be more like eyeglasses. And it's an order of magnitude thicker than eyeglasses. And so just from the get-go, we know that form factor and comfort are, are key driving factors to make not just the ultimate visual experience, but an ergonomic one that you actually want to replace other display devices with. So these are sort of the five driving factors of comfort I see for display researchers like me. We have to make these things as thin and as light and as comfortable as eyeglasses, form factor. Accommodation is a problem that no other display had to solve because it's already correctly focused. A two-dimensional plane presented at an actual physical distance has no virgins accommodation conflict. It's only once you have a three-dimensional display where accommodation becomes a core research challenge for display technology. Also, everywhere else in the spectrum, we have a direct view display device. It's only at the ends where we start using viewing optics. And so that brings a new challenge that we did not need to solve except for in projection displays, which are optical distortions. Things like pupil swim, where the distortion depends on the position of the eye. And then new factors. We want to wear these devices for hours a day. We have to solve prescription in a good form factor. And finally, we want to bridge both augmented, mixed, and virtual reality. We need good pass-through. We need to see the environment and the environment needs to see us so that these, again, are natural human devices that support natural interaction. If we can do all these things, now we get to play the display engineer game. We can look into one of these headsets and we can see what's wrong with them, what needs to be worked on. So VR, we're chasing that ultimate VR cave, super immersive wide fields of view, but rather low resolutions because it's just a pixel game at the moment. You can never have enough pixels, it seems. And then on the right in AR, we're constrained by form factor. 
if you believe that only glasses are acceptable, then within modern waveguide technology, we have limited fields of view and, and quite non-uniform uh, imagery compared to a direct view display. So these become the second pillar of challenges you need to solve in a sense to create the ultimate display for the metaverse. Resolution, first and foremost, every other display in our life is 2020 visual acuity, but not so in VR and AR. Field of view, again, my passion is to create the ultimate display, which means the full human field of view, or at least the full field of view supported by eyewear, full human dynamic range, full color gamut of reality. If we're talking about AR, as much as people want to believe AR is the future, it has a major problem. It can't subtract light from reality. And so solving occlusion is going to be a key roadblock to achieving parity with the contrast of direct view displays. And then of course, pass through I mentioned earlier is not just about comfort, it is about realism. The, the most realistic content you're gonna get is reality itself. Capturing the environment you're in, passing it through the, the full display stack and recreating reality is a necessary first step for immersion. And if you can do this, why did we do it? And at least for me, the answer is of course everything. It's what Ivan said. Everything we can imagine would be made possible by such displays. But what drives me, even before this pandemic, is the idea of eliminating distance, right? If we could actually feel present together. When I sit down on my couch, a relative from the other side of the earth could be there with me and I really believe it, really believe they're physically present, that they're they occlude the light from the couch, the shadows are cast correctly. This would transform, you know, it would eliminate distance. We could work from anywhere. We could be with our loved ones, no matter our separation. This is a grandiose vision. It's not the full vision of the metaverse, but it's what drives me personally, because it, it does not exist. That degree of telecommunication has never existed in my life. That's why I get on airplanes. All right, so hopefully at this point, at least you can understand where I'm coming from as a researcher. We have an ultimate display, we know the problems. Now it's just a question of you have a finite number of years in your career, what do you work on next? And the long answer is all of this together jointly. And so all of these topics uh, I've lectured on over the last uh, seven years and, and, and even before, we're working on all these topics, but this is a, a rather short presentation today. So I'll give you some highlights and then connect the threads at the end. And I'll emphasize work I haven't presented uh, as recently, because it's always more interesting to hear the news. So let's start with my personal feeling. Personally, the thing I feel we have to work on, think about it for a moment, which one do you think I'm gonna choose? Which one would you choose? I think it has to be form factor. This is not everyone's choice, but again, if we're really creating the ultimate display, I want it to be something you might choose instead of your laptop, instead of your cell phone. It has to be so light, and so comfortable that you'd wear it for hours a day. I think this, this is a challenge, I think that's worth, worth more attention than others. And so it's what I actually started on. The first AR and VR uh, product uh, or, or research project I ever worked on was this one in 2013, which tried to address form factor. And so we found that by shrinking and tiling the viewing optics for a VR headset, we could get to those eyeglasses I think are so necessary. The way we did it, is not particularly important. It was just to show it's possible that VR is not this bulky shoebox. It has potential to actually be not a headset, not goggles, but actual real deal glasses. And so here's what it looked like at the time. If you look into it, decent image, at least for a, a rather new industrial researcher, decent image, but nowhere close to 2020 visual acuity. And so this was my first taste of the cruel trade space of optical science that yes, we, we shrunk the form factor, but we gave up 2020 visual acuity and perhaps with a high enough resolution screen, just the right micro lens array, we might, we might get it. Or diffraction might, might actually put a wall on what we could achieve. And so this, this helped me know for the next eight years after I did this project, it helped set a path for me and my team to avoid clever ideas that, that, that find a dead end. I don't know if this is truly a dead end, but at least for now, it has been. It, it got us form factor, but gave up too much of the visual experience in getting there. So here is attempt number two, eight years later, at trying to create a pair of VR glasses. Here's where we're at a few years ago, five years ago with the Oculus Rift. This is what my team put together. 
there's a lot of caveats here. You know, we, we gutted the electronics. This is just the bare minimum. It's a viewing optic and a panel. The driver electronics would need to be external, but we believe this is possible. And so it achieves the same eyeglasses like form factor, but it does it without giving up so much. And so how we did this was we used a very old optical technology known as a holographic optical element. And this wasn't something that was really on my radar eight years ago. And we combined that with polarization optical folding. And in a moment, you'll see that that actually allowed us to take a modern VR architecture without many changes and actually make glasses. And so it means we didn't compromise so much. We retain the field of view, we retain the resolution. It's not really a different architecture, it's just a different variant. So here's what the lens looks like. It's just a film, a holographic film that's been carefully exposed. You can think of it as having, in a sense, the hologram of a lens. Uh, and here's how it works. So on the left, we have what most VR systems have today, a refractive singlet lens with a big long back focal length uh, from a separated by a display. So this might be somewhere around five centimeters or a little less thick in a modern VR headset. To get that down to sub centimeter, first we folded it. Uh, this is a, a, a concept that many people are exploring known as polarization folding. It's more than 30 years old at this point, uh, but that gets you a third of the thickness sort of instantly. Uh, you can fold by a factor of three. And then at that point, the thickness of a pancake type lens, a polarization folded lens is entirely driven by the thickness of the panel and the thickness of a lens. So by flattening the lens into a hologram, we take something that's many millimeters thick down to hundreds of microns or less. And then we're just down to the, the display and the air being the thickest elements. Here's what our VR viewing optic uh, looks like. So again, just to make this clear, it's a display panel. Right on top of that is a holographic lens, an air gap, and then a reflective polarizer. So the lens is actually counterintuitively on the display, but optically close to your eye. And this achieves not quite the form factor of what I did eight years ago, but it achieves very high resolution, very high contrast. So it's, it's about three times thicker than what I did before, but still on the order of eyeglasses. Here's what the prototype looks like. So you can see it's a proper VR headset. It's a research prototype. This one is laser illuminated in, in green, uh, but we have built full color prototypes. So now's the part where I try to step back and say, well, what did I learn in almost a decade of being a researcher in the field? Well, I learned you do have to cut with the grain. We have to find these ideas where everything moves together. And so once we built this, no one actually commented on how thin and light it was. Everyone who saw this demo commented on how saturated the colors were because this is a laser illuminated headset. It slams the primaries all the way to the edge of the horseshoe. And so we have this very brilliant display. You've never, probably none of you have experienced a laser illuminated display or very few of you. It's beautiful. And so what that meant is we actually, without really going in with that plan, we figured out a high, color gamut display at the same time as form factor. So now you got to ask how many things did we also check off? And so very briefly, I'll explain, I think it's absolutely critical in addition to form factor, we need retinal resolution. If we're to read text, which is the primary content most of us consume, it has to be at retinal resolution, 2020 visual acuity. Uh, now, those of you who work in the display industry, these numbers are not the right numbers. The right numbers are pixels per degree. And so where the industry wants to get to is 60 pixels per degree. Where we're at today is this red zone, 10-ish pixels per degree. We're seeing emerging products and, and concepts that get us in the, the green middle zone. But many optical concepts actually struggle, struggle to create an optical transfer function that's sharp enough to resolve a 60 pixel per degree uh, underlying display. And so this is just one example. We've worked on many high resolution headsets on my team, but this is a variant of what I just showed you where we replace the outer uh, reflective polarizer with a polarization volume hologram. So we add a second holographic optical element that happens to be polarization sensitive. And if you place a chrome mask beneath it, that's the equivalent of a 5K display, something that doesn't routinely exist now, but could easily exist in the near future, it can actually resolve this 5K display, not just straight ahead, 
but even in the far periphery. And so this is an experimental result, but if you look at the bar chart here, even quite far off the optical axis, probably far enough that your eyes normally wouldn't gaze at this angle, it's actually resolving a one arc minute display. And so again, this starts to feel like a next generation display system. We get form factor, we get resolution, we get color gamut. So where do we go from here? And so I think where we go from here is to think about the limits of eyeglasses themselves. And that would be field of view. So let's take a moment to think about this, but change gears uh, for this presentation. So we've been talking a lot about VR. AR, of course, has an equal stake in the future all the way on the right-hand side of my original figure. And there, I think the key challenge is field of view, right? If we look at modern waveguides, do they have enough field of view to give you a good visual experience? Remember, one of my driving things is telepresence. Do we have enough field of view to even look at a natural one-to-one -one scale human in an AR device? Are we going to have to shrink our virtual humans down and start losing some of the benefits of a three-dimensional spatial computing device? So this is a very simple question. It's one of the first ones I asked you know, along my path uh, at, of joining Facebook Reality Labs. It's just, is it enough, right? I'm a troublemaker at heart. Of course, I know what the roadmaps are in the industry. I know what fields of view are possible, but I don't really care. I wanna know if any of those fields of view are gonna be enough. And so let me tell you a different take. Again, sort of eight years on in my mission of studying augmented virtual reality, rather than worrying so much about publications, I started to worry about the experience. And so here's a little, little thought experiment I did. It's probably four years old at this point. Are sunglasses even enough? Field of view of sunglasses, right? People always say, oh, glasses are enough. The field of view of sunglasses is not actually as large as you think. So one of my colleagues, Brian Wheelwright, took a pair of sunglasses outdoors and he measured the field of view. Now, the first thing I think is you need to ask an optical scientist. Many individuals report field of view in degrees. It's the wrong unit because it doesn't give you a good sense if you double the number of degrees, does it mean you really doubled the immersion? The correct unit, those of you who have a physics background, is of course the one my colleague Brian made, which is steradian, solid angle. So if you measure the solid angle binocularly of a pair of standard sunglasses, you get about 3.3 steradians. Human vision is actually 5.3 steradians binocularly, depending on how you count it, which means that sunglasses, the ultimate glasses, if you will, are only 63% of the human field of view. And so if you're really trying to create the ultimate immersive device, it already means that the form factor of sunglasses will limit you. But for AR, I think we'd accept that these need to be fashionable devices. So let's just go with sunglasses and accept that the one true metric for AR is what percent of the, of the solid angle is your device. 100% of sunglasses, we'd all agree, it's not the ultimate VR immersion, but it's the ultimate AR one. And I did this, you know, eight years ago, right out of grad, uh, out of my postdoc, to understand field of view. You know, you get these cardboard tubes and you cut them and you walk around the lab a whole day. You you go and get a coffee. You talk to coworkers. You try to edit a document, and most of the time, you try to convince yourself that the very low AR fields of view are enough. It's going to be okay. I can edit a document. I never felt satisfied by that because it wasn't actually a time machine of the experience. It didn't give you your peripheral field of view. So this is something we built four years ago that I haven't quite seen built before, even though it's obvious. We took a pair of shutter glasses, like you'd have in a VR cave. We added motion capture balls to them. And if you think about just some off the shelf components, first, it gives you 100% the field of view, nearly 100% the field of view of sunglasses. If you have good projectors and you stand a meter or two away, you can easily get quite close to retinal resolution. And you can wear this all day. It's 48 grams, no problem. I can work an eight hour day in it. So we built this into, I think, the first real time machine for AR glasses. So here's what we built. Again, starts off just like a VRK. We have shutter glasses tracked by, by motion capture. And up above, it's like one wall of a VR cave. We have a high resolution projector, but the key difference, again, I haven't quite seen it, which is a surprise to me when we built it. I thought many people had done this before. 
replace the wall of a VR cave with a low cost translucent scrim like you'd have in theatrical projection. The reason to do this is now you have a real AR experience. Rather than using VR glasses to emulate AR, where you have latency, contrast loss, resolution loss, reality is real, the augmentations are augmented, and you have the full field of view of eyeglasses. So we call this an AR cave. And I recommend those of you working in the field, it's easy to put one of these together, it takes a few weeks, and you actually get to experience the ultimate AR display. I'm probably the only one in the audience who's actually experienced full AR like I'll have 20 years from now. 100% of sunglasses field of view. I've read a Google document at, rec at, at uh, retinal resolution. I've checked the weather, read the news. Uh, it's an interesting experience that you can actually get rid of your monitor and have this virtual monitor. And so now you can ask the question. This is why I built this with my team. It was to answer a simple question. What field of view is needed for telepresence? And so here you can see, remember the one true metric is percent of sunglasses field of view, not degrees. Most AR devices on the market today are about five to 10% the field of view of sunglasses. If we'd had 20% the field of view of sunglasses, that would be a monumental leap in AR display technology. And so look at the green box, that's beyond state-of-the-art or beyond known path of state-of-the-art AR. And I have two coworkers standing with me and I'm just looking at what field of view would be needed. And you'll see just trying to have a natural conversation with two individuals, which someday will be remote, you can't quite keep them framed, certainly not at the current state of the art and even at a much larger AR field of view. And so I think this goes to what, what visual experiences, what user experiences will we have in AR if we can't have multiple participants framed at natural scale. This makes a design challenge, not a research challenge. And so just to nail home the point, this is the, the demo I gave everyone in the lab. Uh, so here I actually emulate the future AR telepresence call where I have two participants that are here, just some basic computer graphics. You're viewing them at 20%, so a little beyond state-of-the-art AR field of view. And you can, see, you can see one individual when you're looking at them, but you're actually missing the second individual in the conversation. It's you're losing those emotional cues, the body language, how they react to the other individual. So this, this helps to really inspire me that this simple little demo that took a few weeks to build helps you know that, yeah, field of view is a core challenge of AR. We all knew it, but now we can start actually running studies and understanding what is enough. Uh, so that's, that's the AR cave. Let me take a few more moments and tell you uh, one more challenge uh, in AR. And I think this is even more fundamental and even harder to solve than field of view. Sure, 20%, 50%, 100% of sunglasses, incredibly hard for those of you working on waveguide and related technologies, but occlusion. Occlusion is the one that, that makes the right hand and left hand side of my diagram collapse. If AR glasses could remove light from reality, there is no difference. VR and AR are one and the same other than the form factor. It's either glasses or goggles or something else. But if you can subtract light and add light, you've created the ultimate XR device. So how hard is occlusion? How hard is it to subtract light? Well, first of all, just like field of view, most people convince themselves, ah, it's going to be OK. We'll just crank up the brightness. So this is a cloudy day in Seattle, and we emulated a weather app just trying to overlay, you know, say you're taking a walk and, you know, the overlay ends up where it is. It's quite hard to see. And of course, it's this struggle, you know, you can boost the brightness, but at some point, you know, you're, you're going to either flood the eye with so much light, they dilate, or you just can't quite win there. What you want to do, of course, is remove light. And there's a lot of work. Many of you in the audience have worked on this topic. Roughly, I'd classify this into three buckets. In the middle is the obvious solution, which is an optical relay. The problem here is we want to put a spatial light modulator out in the world, but we can't really afford to push around a two meter screen everywhere we go. So we have to relay some small spatial light modulator, like an LCD, optically to the world, which means you end up with these periscope constructions. Even if you use the clever holographic optics we showed earlier, you probably will struggle to create an optical relay that can, can put a spatial light modulator conjugate to a distant plane. 
in a small eyeglasses like form factor. So I think the relayed ones are great as time machines. You can build a pair of binoculars, you can walk around and see what occlusion looks like in AR. I recommend you do that. That's very interesting. You could go to the light fields like I worked on eight to 10 years ago. Problem with that is once again, you're making an optical relay by tiling. And so that introduces for AR a lot of limitations on field of view, on resolution, you know, diffraction is going to cause artifacts for the see-through environment. It won't look like eyeglasses. Uh, and so I think this path academically is fascinating. It doesn't feel like a practical path we're actually on. And so what we're left with is the most obvious idea that almost anyone comes up with in five minutes of discussion, which is the idea of local dimming. Simply take whatever your AR display is and slap a spatial light modulator directly to the front and take what you can get because it might be better than nothing. So let's talk about this one for a moment. I think it's a pretty common idea in the field, but this events for a larger audience. So the idea would be we can create our augmentation using any AR device, off axis, combiner, waveguide, whatever it is, right after that device on the world side, put a, a liquid crystal or some other spatial light modulator, a transparency in front of the world, and that will give you local occlusion. So, you know, your pupil has a non-zero non size, so you're going to get this blurry occlusion mask. It probably won't help you pass the ultimate visual Turing test because you can't get sharp edge boundaries, but you could certainly make a, a, a plane of text, a virtual monitor, much higher contrast. Uh, and so again, these are, these are one of those things I've learned you talk about in the hallways at a conference. Everyone knows the idea, but no one's seen it. Just sort of like the, the AR cave I mentioned earlier. Everyone can imagine what AR is, but no one's actually seen it. And so I think this is, again, 10 years into this, a key thing I identify we need to do in our community, which is demo more. Build these time machines that are actually good enough that you learn more than a hallway conversation can, can intuit. Uh, so here you go. We have a, a sort of mock-up for those of you just to remind you what we're doing. We have a, a, a combiner whether that's a waveguide or some other device, creating a virtual image, say at two meters. Then right in front of it, we have a sharp occluder that becomes effectively a blurry occluder on the world side. And so we've built a bunch of prototypes of this, uh, but again, I haven't shared this one publicly before. So again, this is, this is a different take on things. It's not really publishable research, but it's the first time I ever experienced this. We, we built an off axis uh, combiner system so we could have a very wide AR field of view. So much, much higher than the 20% we saw earlier. So very immersive AR. We added accommodation technology. So we have a, a verifocal system in this. And then we added an occlusion mask. We didn't worry about making this look pretty. It was all about getting to experience it. And so hopefully after this pandemic, people can visit our lab and we can, we can do some demos. But this is, to my knowledge, the first local dimming demo ever built. Uh, with a complete sixed off headset. So you can see we're just drawing the simple low, uh, initials of the lab, but this is what you would get without local dimming. This is what you do with. And so all of a sudden these hallway speculations of like, I don't know, I think it'll be okay. Or like, no, it won't possibly be good enough. You should just globally dim everything or nothing. You end those debates and you simply see it and decide whether designers can use this concept for value or not. So there you have it. I'm going to wrap things up. I would love to go for another hour and tell you about all of our aspects, but you can find those all over the internet in various places. I'm very proud that, that FRL has given me a home for the last eight years, uh, seven years to explore all these things. As a research scientist, I have to be honest that I increasingly am trying to find a path forward where all these things can be moved together. But the truth is we haven't found it as an industry. We have things that are, are, quite established in VR, like a refractive singlet architecture or, or a pancake lens architecture. And in AR, we have things like waveguides, but pushing beyond that has proven very difficult. And so that's really the core challenge anyone's working in this field is we are making the ultimate display device. It only matters if we move everything or nearly everything together. But what we have done as a community since Ivan Sutherland started us in 1965 is we've found hundreds of building blocks from holographic optical elements through light field displays. We have so many concepts. We don't lack for those. We're finding new ones every day. 
Again, I think I'm trying to encourage our community that what we need next are new architectures, things like the holographic optical concept where multiple axes can move forward together. And the other thing, I think we should be more open to demos of old ideas that much of what I spoke about is an old idea. I didn't speak about it today, but I've spent many years working on verifocal displays, retinal resolution displays, high resolution insets, AR test beds, all of these things are obvious in some sense, but they need to be done. And they haven't all been done. I haven't done all the work. And so I really think being more open, even academically, to time machines, perceptual test beds, this is how we can end debates and start moving in a coherent direction towards the ultimate display, which is, of course, AR and VR. Thank you. Dr. Lehmann, thank you for sharing your thoughts on the importance of the ultimate display for AR-VR system and for reviewing challenges of wearable AR-VR display system and Facebook's efforts to solve these technical challenges. Now, our third speaker is Professor Byung-ho Lee. Professor Byung-ho Lee is a professor of electrical and computer engineering at the Seoul National University. Professor Lee is a fellow of IEEE, SPIE, OSA, and SID. Professor Lee also served as a senior member of the National Academy of Engineering of Korea and a member of the Korean Academy of Science and Technology. Today, Professor Lee will be discussing for real impact of metaverse. Please, Professor Lee. Thank you, Professor Hong. Uh, I'm Byung-ho Lee with Seoul National University, and it is my great pleasure and honor to give a talk uh, today. The title of my presentation is uh, For Real Impact of Metaverse. This is the outline of my presentation. After a short introduction on metaverse, uh, let me uh, talk about why uh, is it uh, drawing uh, attention and what improvements are uh, needed for real social impact. And then I'll talk about optical challenges, uh, current optical technologies, and uh, critical issues for AR, VR headsets, and advanced technologies for uh, VR and AR. And then I'll conclude my talk. Most of you are familiar with the terminology such as uh, augmented reality or uh, virtual reality, I guess. And the uh, computer generated virtual environment uh, provides us uh, a good uh, opportunity of uh, virtual reality. And here's the real world and augmented reality. In, in the case of augmented reality, uh, most environments are real world based and only uh, partial environments are uh, artificial uh, 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 from the computer. And there's a different level of a mixture between real world and uh, virtual world and it can be called the mixed reality and actually in the mixed reality uh, interaction is also very important and uh, there's another terminology uh, called the extended reality or xr uh, in xr also uh, interaction is uh, more stressed and x can be uh, a v or m Recently, the uh, metaverse is uh, a hot issue. And as uh, Michael Kass uh, mentioned, the terminology of uh, metaverse was uh, first uh, appeared in the novel uh, of uh, Neil Stevenson. Uh, although the concept was uh, I mean, uh, suggested quite earlier, and the metaverse uh, is coined from the word meta and universe. And meta means beyond. And so it's, it can be considered as a kind of a collective virtual shared space and the virtual environment and physical reality are linked and shared by the internet. Uh, there are unique characteristics of metaverse, uh, which are also the uh, cause of drawing much attention very recently. Users have almost no limitations of action and no limitation in the, the number of participants. And users can create their own avatars and environment 
and make them interact with each other. More than that, the created world can be saved on the physically sustainable uh, virtual uh, space. Uh, very famous examples of uh, uh, such metaverse platforms are Roblox, uh, Geppetto, and Decentraland. Also, uh, the arbitrary environment can be created and, uh, and uh, uh, it can be applied to various purposes. Uh, for example, the entrance or graduation ceremonies of universities and so many enterprises purposes and global marketing and uh, entertainment and also some uh, idol uh, concerts on uh, uh, metaverse. Yes, uh, there are many, many such applications. And um, monetizing is also very uh, interesting and fascinating in metaverse. Global uh, enterprises collaborate with metaverse platforms and release virtual products. For example, uh, Gucci is uh, co cooperating with uh, some metaverse platforms and uh, we can uh, purchase Gucci suits or accessories uh, and then uh, my avatar can put on the Gucci suits with small monies. With the development of a blockchain technology and non-fungible token, uh, which is usually called the NFT, uh, users can earn digital currency or purchase virtual products or even virtual land. Uh, in the platform of Decentraland, uh, we can purchase the, the virtual land. Actually, they limit the whole area of the virtual land. And so the price for the land uh, is uh, I mean, uh, increasing as in, in the real world situation. Of course, COVID-19 affects quite much on the metaverse. Social distancing is ongoing uh, worldwide uh, uh, due to the, the, the widespread of uh, COVID-19 and depression by the uh, pandemic and lack of social interactions accelerated the, the adoption of a metaverse. And uh, also the importance of individual's hobby is increasing, which also affects uh, the metaverse. Advances in graphic technologies is also important uh, as uh, explained by uh, Michael Kass. Entertainment enterprises produ uh, produce high quality virtual contents that can be loaded on metaverse platforms and realistic movements of objects and human characters make metaverse immersive. Metaverse is a, a very hot topic, uh, especially in Korea. Uh, these are examples of uh, uh, the searching results with the term metaverse on uh, neighbor or town. And uh, there are lots of uh, news on metaverse every day, but uh, there is uh, also limitation now uh, because uh, most users are teenagers uh, and uh, only the, the uh, except that only uh, some events are uh, the, 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 uh, util utilizing the metaverse such as the graduation ceremonies or some educations or for some uh, entertainment concerts so, like that. So actually there's a, a, there are some people who uh, actually suspect uh, whether the metaverse can be a real social impact or uh, it can just be a, a bubble. Actually, many, many years ago, there's, there was a kind of uh, uh, platform called the Second Life, which is uh, still alive. But actually, it's like an early version of Metaverse, but uh, it did not make a great success. So uh, there should be a kind of a, a driving force for the new uh, trend of Metaverse, uh, uh, for it not to be uh, the, the uh, not to follow the uh, model of uh, the, the previous case of the, uh, this kind of uh, previous examples. Then uh, what improvements are needed for the real social impact of Metaverse? First, 
uh, contents uh, uh, mainly focused on games or short-term events now. So the, those contents are still being consumed by uh, only people of limited classes or uh, age group. So uh, sustainable contents for uh, daily uses or a killer application fulfilling public needs should be uh, developed. And uh, let me go. Uh, and these are uh, some examples of well-known Korean companies which make the photo realistic, which make the photo realistic in the London. Maybe, uh, they are wonderful, but actually it gives uh, much burden in computing and data transfer. So uh, there could be some kind of uh, the, the uh, a, a agreement. I mean, uh, depending on the applications, in some cases, we really need a photorealistic image rendering. But for other applications, uh, that, kind of, that kind of high quality rendering might uh, cause some uh, difficulty of widespread appli uh, the, the applications or popularity. And uh, there's another issue of uh, high-speed rendering and data transfer. Uh, if uh, I use uh, a, this kind of uh, head-mount displays for VR uh, entertainment, uh, if I move my head, actually the camera, uh, the, the uh, sensor should uh, uh, the, the, uh, sense the movement of the, uh, my, my head, and then uh, the image should be rendered in real time uh, within the response uh, time of a uh, nervous system. Typically, current VR headsets have the average latency of 30 to 50 milliseconds, but uh, it should be 20 milliseconds or less than 20 milliseconds or even uh, 10 milliseconds. So latency results in visual fatigue or nausea. So it is a very uh, critical issue. And uh, regarding the computational load, actually the computation can be done on server, but then uh, there should be high speed communication technology connecting the, uh, the, the device and the server computers. For example, uh, 5G and 6G, uh, the high speed communication uh, should be used. And there's a, an issue on ethics or securities, uh, the, such as a privacy violation, uh, virtual property robbery, hacking and data sniffing, sexual or racial harassment, and commercial fraud. Uh, of course, many of them are typical issues on internet, but uh, there could be new legal issues uh, uh, coming up, such as the copyright of creation in Metaverse, uh, because uh, users can make uh, their own avatars and then create uh, their uh, some uh, facilities or create even create uh, their buildings on the Metaverse, and there could be some a kind of copyright issues and also uh, AI assisted creation is possible in, in some metaverse platforms and so also the copyright could be an issue, legal issue. Another critical issue is uh, the AR VR devices and current VR AR devices still have issues of a bulky form factor, as Douglas Landman explained, uh, narrow field of view and eye box. Uh, and also uh, the, uh, the focus queue is limited. Uh, these kind of limitations hinder uh, the immersive metaverse experience. So actually the many characteristics or properties are full of the trade-off and there are lots of challenges as uh, Doug explained. From now, let me talk about the optical challenges in VR AR uh, devices. For the virtual reality headset, uh, this is a typical structure. And here's the display panel and here's the lens. And uh, the separation between lens and display panel is smaller than uh, focal length of the lens. Then, 
the image is uh, floating uh, at a far distance uh, with uh, magnification like this. So, uh, and also uh, we have two eyes. So this is, uh, uh, there are two panels and uh, the images uh, overlap like this. And we usually provide the stereo images for left eye and right eye. And these are the overlap uh, region. And uh, due to this optical uh, characteristics, actually there should be some space eye. Uh, although the space between lens and display panel is empty space, uh, we cannot arbitrarily reduce the space. So it, the, uh, basically the virtual reality headset becomes bulky. These are well-known uh, VR headsets and they have a uh, field of view, uh, quite good field of view. And these are the uh, panel resolutions, and, but usually they are uh, bulky. For AR glasses devices, actually it is more difficult to make the system compared with VR devices. That is because for AR devices, the outside light should come in uh, as well as the uh, this light from the display panel. So this is a, a typical simple example of the structure. And here is a display panel and light is uh, going in this direction. And there is a concave mirror, a reflected light goes to eye after being reflected again at half a mirror. And outside light is coming through the half a mirror and goes to the eye. But uh, this structure has a small field of view and there are uh, diverse uh, uh, versions of uh, these kind of uh, uh, AR devices. And uh, this is uh, ca the case of off-axis imaging and the light guide. Uh, in this example, the image is projected from this direction and uh, uh, it is guided by uh, total reflection and there are partial mirrors uh, embedded in the uh, light guide and light is partially reflected and goes to eye. In this case, uh, the waveguide is thinner than uh, the light guide, several millimeters typically, and image is projected from here, and it is uh, deflected like this, and uh, with total internal reflection, it uh, propagates through the waveguide, and it goes to eye. And here are uh, very uh, interesting devices called the in-coupler and out-coupler. And the light is uh, deflected or diffracted in this direction. And also the light is diffracted in this direction. Those kinds of uh, devices can be implemented uh, with uh, the diffractive optical elements or uh, surface relief gratings, or it can be also implemented with uh, holographic optical elements. Uh, uh, as uh, uh, Douglas Lamman explained. But anyway, you know, there are lots of technologies, but they have uh, some uh, advantages, but uh, also they have uh, some disadvantages. These are very well-known uh, examples of AR headsets. Microsoft HoloLens uh, have a relatively smaller uh, field of view compared with uh, VR headsets. Uh, generally speaking, the field of view of AR devices is smaller than uh, VR devices because for the VR devices, uh, we can block outside the light. So we, we can easily make uh, uh, the lens, wide view lens in front of uh, our eyes and then uh, the field of view can be enlarged. But for AR devices, uh, such a case will distort the light from outside view. So uh, the design is more uh, difficult and uh, this kind of uh, specification is uh, uh, not as good as uh, the VR devices. There are uh, many key performance factors. Uh, actually, uh, Doug explained the, uh, these factors and more than that, uh, he explained many, many important factors. But so I will briefly mention these kind of factors. A field of view is uh, important and form factor or size of the device or weight of the device is also important. And there are some efforts to use 
a metasurface flat lens uh, to be used for the AI devices. And iBox is also an issue. Uh, in general case, uh, there's a, an eye box uh, the, denoted as a blue box here, and the images can be uh, observed correctly within this eye box. And here's the eye box, and here's the uh, eye pupil. If eye pupil is moving out of the eye box, uh, the images cannot be observed. So uh, it is important to, to uh, enlarge eye box, but uh, to enlarge eye box, uh, the field of view or resolution can be uh, sacrificed. So there are many uh, efforts to, uh, for example, to move the eye box uh, with the, uh, with the, uh, the, the uh, sensing of the eye, uh, eye pupil location. And this is an example of such cases. Although the eye pupil is moving, the eye box is following the location of the eye pupil and the correct images can be observed. Image quality is also important. Also aberration, I mean, to minimize the aberration is also important. The aberration can also cause fatigue. Uh, in observation. Also, focus cue is important. In stereo imaging, which means that uh, left eye image and right eye images are separately provided, and then the floating image is intend to, intended to uh, float here. And then uh, we observe the images. Uh, so this is the uh, Bolton's uh, distance uh, the, and converging angle between the two eyes. But for the two eyes to observe clear images, actually they look at the uh, screen or floating images uh, from the uh, head mount displays. So there's a di uh, difference between Bolton's distance and accommodation distance, which uh, causes uh, fatigue. So this is a very important uh, factor uh, to be resolved. So generally speaking, for the uh, VR, AR headsets, uh, these are typical, uh, the, the state of the art, uh, the uh, specifications of the devices. Uh, the the uh, weights are uh, from 100 to 500 or more, more than that uh, grams. And the thickness is uh, three centimeters or even larger than that, uh, like five centimeters or uh, larger uh, and so on. And uh, the depth of 3D uh, image is fixed at a far distance of two meters typically. So ideal desired VR, AR uh, glasses uh, could have these kind of uh, properties. First, the weight should be very uh, small, like the usual typical uh, glasses. And the thickness should be small. And uh, for example, the resolution should be higher and contrast should be much higher than the current uh, status. And uh, it is desirable that the depths of 3D depths can vary from uh, 30 centimeter to infinity, for example. And the price is um, also a very important factor. And also the battery life is very important. Uh, typically the battery life now is two hours or less. And so it, it, is, uh, it is better to have long life and high brightness is also a very critical issue. In typical AI devices, uh, they can be used only indoor, but for outdoor uh, applications, uh, we should have a higher brightness. From now, let me talk about a few examples of advanced VR technologies, mostly the work from my lab. And in this case, uh, the, we are using focus tunable lens, and then we change the focal length, and here's the display, uh, image uh, for one image frame. Uh, uh, actually, what we want to do is that uh, we want to implement 80, 80 
depth of image planes. Uh, so for single image plane, actually we illuminate backlight for different depths uh, over the 80 layers of depths uh, in synchronization with the uh, focal length change of the lens. So uh, we can do that in re real time if we are using micro mirror devices, which can operate very fast. So these are the... Um, These are the uh, experimental results. Uh, take the photos are take the uh, videos are taken at uh, one one meter uh, and twenty uh, centimeters. So in in that case, actually, uh, the conflict between versions and accommodation can be minimized. And here is a thin. VR uh, structure. Uh, so uh, Doug also explained the, uh, the very wonderful devices and we can, we also modify the devices and we also, we are using the uh, light pass folding and also we are using lay, lens arrays to further uh, decrease the gap. And we made uh, a, uh, a device with 3.3 .3 millimeter gap or eight millimeter uh, total thickness. We introduced our new compact VR optics design, lens lip VR. The lens lip VR structure has a glasses like form factor. At the same time, it has a great optical performance for VR, such as field of view, eye box, and eye relief. Let me introduce the principle and the demonstration results. Current VR devices have a form factor of a headset. Ironically, most volume of the conventional single lens system is occupied by the air. This thick air gap between the display panel and the lens is only necessary to secure the optical pass length. In order to reduce the gap, we utilize the lens lead array. Since the lens lead array can have a much shorter focal length than the single lens, we can reduce the thickness of the gap to 10 mm. Additionally, we also utilize the optical pass folding system. By inserting a few polarization controlling films inside, we can make the light bounce back and forth. The necessary gap and let me show you like the, the experimental, uh, I mean, results. Two degrees. The eye box size of our prototype is 8.8 mm by 8.8 mm. As the camera position moves, we can observe a fine continuous image within the eye box. And now we are within in the eye box, but now we are moving out of the eye box. Then Until there's a distortion. So, yeah, anyway, we were successful in uh, making very thin VR devices. There are lots of researches going on uh, in my group and other groups, uh, especially at Stanford University and Facebook Reality Labs, MIT, and so on. So in this case, uh, we, we are trying to uh, correct the, uh, the aberrations of the lens or errors in reflective uh, powers of the uh, devices. So there are uh, lots of works on done, uh, which can be done on the uh, image processing for this kind of applications. And also there are lots of researches on holographic displays and uh, the eyewear devices can also have uh, holographic images as well, uh, rather than just the stereo images. If we use holographic images, the uh, versions accommodation mismatch can be minimized. But usually uh, the calculation time or image rendering time of the uh, holographic image is quite uh, huge. So there are lots of researches uh, to 
adopt AI technologies or deep learning technologies in hologram generation. So now let me conclude my talk. Uh, there are several, I mean, uh, key factors for metaverse, uh, which are uh, the diverse and sustainable contents. Uh, those kind of uh, contents should be uh, generated more and more for the uh, popular applications of metaverse platform and and high speed communication is needed uh, for the uh, not only for the low latency algorithm but also for the large uh, computational load on server and eth there's ethics and security issues and also i think the final issue will be the optical breakthrough uh, so uh, minimizing the visual fatigue and compact system size and wide field of view and eye box for the uh, AR and VR devices uh, will be uh, needed for further uh, wider popularization of the metaverse. Yeah, there are uh, many IT companies who are very eagerly working on the AR, VR devices and also uh, Metaverse. So I think the future of Metaverse is bright and uh, uh, many research, many more researchers are needed and uh, uh, many research funding is also needed as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Lee, for touching on the societal implications of the Metaverse and for reviewing technical challenges and your achievement in optical engineering for realistic metaverse world. Our final keynote speaker today is Professor Untek Wu. Professor Untek Wu is a professor and the head of the Graduate School of Culture Technology at Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. He also serves as the director of both CT Research Institute and KIITC Augmented Reality Research Center. Today, his lecture is titled The Possibilities of Reality Virtual Convergence Platforms, Digital Twins, Metaverse, and Virtual Augmented Reality. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank SK Cha Jonghyun Hakshuron for inviting me here. Uh, it is my pleasure to have a chance uh, to share my experience and the thought on the uh, future direction of metaverse. Uh, I will present on the possibility uh, of uh, reality and virtuality convergence platform in terms of digital twin metaverse and e extended reality. Today, uh, I will talk about the forest rather, rather than trees. Key concept rather than uh, rather than the detailed individual technology. Uh, then I will talk about the possible future directions. Uh, some is already curious whether the metaverse is a bubble or not. Uh, some ask me whether uh, winter comes again. How can we make a metaverse uh, sustainable? How can we make it socially beneficial? It, it is pretty much important issue. Uh, the core message of my talk is the metaverse go beyond the just a uh, fun play space. It is a near uh, virtual convergence platform at the same time uh, it is social social media and economic platform uh, that can anyone anyone can easily access and utilize it in uh, their daily life so uh, let me explain uh, what what i have done during the last 20 years uh, Actually, I coined the, the, the terminology uh, ubiquitous VR in year 2001. What is the ubiquitous VR? The basic concept of UBR is a virtual reality uh, experienced in smart physical space. Uh, it can be realized uh, by context where augmented reality. How it is possible? Uh, in order to achieve uh, ubiquitous VR, uh, we need uh, three key components. Uh, first, a 3D link between the real and virtual and the augmentation of context of interest. We can augment real physical space with uh, several different type, types of content. It includes uh, information analysis. The last one is the bi-directional in, uh, interaction and collaboration for human-to-human -human communication. So UVR is 
a way to experience and utilize the metaverse in our daily life. Uh, let me explain uh, what I have done last last 10 years and, and then what, what is the plan for the next 10 years. Uh, in the first 10 years, I did a research on the realization of augmented reality in the Ubicom environment. Uh, for this purpose, I collected the signal uh, from uh, various sensors and then analyze or interpret the signal, then augment physical space with the interpreted information. In the last decade, I conducted research on how AR can be used to expand human's capability in terms of human's physical ability, intellectual ability, and social ability. Uh, next 10 years, I will do research on how to expand the capabilities of our society beyond the people. It is closely related to the future direction of a metaverse. Nowadays, uh, Jensen is pretty much famous person in Korea uh, because he claims a metaverse is coming. I think the more accurate expression might be metaverse is coming back in Korea, at least, at least in Korea, the metaverse is coming back. Uh, it is true because the Korea government already invested uh, in metaverse in mid year 2000. Since uh, year 2010, it has disappeared from the people's attention and then forgotten. He is mainly talking about virtual world. However, the more important thing is how to utilize the metaverse in our daily life. Let's see the interesting uh, plot. Uh, this is the Google trend on the, the terminology on uh, metaverse. Uh, as you can see in this plot, you know, the, when the metaverse communities started the discussion in year 2004, uh, there is uh, some, you know, the activities. And then this year, uh, you know, the many people show some, you know, interested in this uh, area. But, you know, the attention decreasing nowadays all over the world. However, if we look at the you know, phenomena in Korea, it is pretty much interesting. As you can see, in mid-2000, there were several spikes. Even Korea government spent a lot of money in this direction. And then recently, you know, the, the attention is increasing every day. That is, that is you know, the interesting point. I, I will skip the, the other plots. So recently, you know, the there are so many opinions about the metaverse in Korea. The VR community claims the second life is the origin of the metaverse. Uh, recently, uh, Infinite Office, uh, supporting office work without going to the company, is regarded as the representative example of the metaverse. The gaming community claims the Roblox or Fortnite is the example of the metaverse. Some define the metaverse as a virtual world experience through the avatars. Some call the metaverse a virtual space where the virtual asset can be traded. Some consider the metaverse is the, you know, the web 3.0. What's then? Then the, what, what's the metaverse? Such various opinion uh, may, might be the story of, the, of an elephant touched by a blind person. So how do we understand the elephant? The topic I want to introduce today is the how to understand the elephant, okay? Uh, in order to understand the relationship between extended reality and the metaverse, uh, we need to understand reality and virtuality continuum. This, this one is a well-known uh, continuum uh, proposed by the Paul Milgram at Toronto University. We are living in a physical reality. And then we can generate virtualized reality. Nowadays, we call it a digital twin. If a real world and the corresponding of virtualized reality exists, then we can merge two together. If we emphasize reality, that can be augmented reality. If we emphasize virtualized reality, that is augmented virtuality. Also, we can remove what we, we don't want to see in physical space, that is diminished reality. Same thing can be happened in virtualized reality. Diminished virtuality might be possible. 
Also, we can mediate the physical object to the other information or space. That is called mediated reality. Somehow, the mediated reality is, you know, the uh, somehow linked to the metaverse. You know, the vertical direction in this figure, the augmented reality and augmented virtuality is called the mixed reality. The mixed reality can be expanded to the vertical direction based on the human's imagination and creativity. This space can be ex experienced and explored through the avatars. I define core as extended re reality or ubiquitous VR. You know, the, as, this is as well known, you know, the uh, fact is the terminology metaverse was introduced by the uh, novel, uh, Snow Crash. That is not the exact, you know, the definition, the novel did, did not define the terminology, just introduced the concept. The first community uh, defined the metaverse as the future internet kind of a shared and open standard-based virtual space. Since then, the ASF uh, defined a metaverse roadmap. In, in, the, in, the, in that document, the metaverse is the convergence of uh, virtually enhanced physical reality and the physically persistent virtual space. You know, the, uh, the metaverse has four key components. The left side, Left side is physical space, right side is society. The upper side is augmentation of information. You know, the bottom side is simulation. By combining these four components, we can, you know, the make US, interesting UX scenario, life logging, you know, the virtual world, middle world, augmented realities, you know, the uh, some component of the metaverse, okay? So the first version of metaverse was introduced in the novel. Then in the middle, as, as I explained in the previous slide, you know, the, in the mid 2000, the uh, metaverse roadmap was introduced. Nowadays, it comes back. Then is it possible to, you know, the, used in our daily life, still there, there is a big question. In order to make it, you know, the, in order to make this new concept in our daily life, there are several issues we have to solve. How can we use this kind of a new concept in our daily life? There might be several possible scenario. One might be using uh, extended reality or augmented reality in physical space. In order to achieve that scenario, we may need uh, glasses as introduced in previous presenters. By the way, is it possible for the wearable metaverse to reopen the digital gold rush in, uh, nowadays? In order to pave the way to the digital gold rush era, the metaverse ecosystem must be well established in advance so that the uh, Reality virtuality convergence space become both a social platform and thus an economic pla economic uh, platform. Uh, to realize such platform, uh, it is uh, necessary to build uh, to build and to utilize integrated infrastructure uh, such as IoT, 5G, uh, data, uh, metaverse, uh, non fungible you know, tokens, or extended reality. Then. For, in order to make a sustainable metaverse, the integrated platform must be open, reliable, and interoperable. At the same time, it is necessary for us to prepare for various social issues, economic issues, and legal issues, as explained previously. Then how can we use uh, this metaverse ecosystem in our daily life? Augmented city uh, might be a good candidate. Augmented city is a smart city that improves our daily lives by organizing, uh, organically integrating ICT technologies uh, based on the digital twin, and then manage and solve city problems through the citizens' participation. So in order to achieve such augmented city, uh, there are several core elements. 
First one is organic linkage between reality and virtualized reality. We can build virtualized reality using the digital twin. 3D augmentation reflecting uh, context uh, as well as a location. In order to use the information in real life, the information needs to be provided based on the location. Location is a good example of the context. We need more intelligence, you know, the, uh, according to the user's request. Also, you have to handle user's you know, intention. The other important thing is connecting people uh, through this metaverse. So bi-directional interaction and collaboration is pretty much, pretty much important. The last one is a participatory problem solving uh, platform, okay? What can you do using this kind of, uh, you know, the uh, platform, especially the augmented city platform? First of all, the augmented city platform can be used for the city planning, monitoring, and operations. Moreover, uh, it can provide the citizens with a new way of experiencing, communicating, and collaborating with the people in, in the metaverse. Uh, this will allow us to expand capabilities of a citizen, cities, and then the society. How it, is it possible? You know, the, originally this idea was proposed to the uh, Busan EDC project. Uh, we can put the IoT sensors here and there in, in the city. Through the high-speed network, uh, neighboring edge and cloud can collect signals. AI can interpret such signal to generate information analysis. Uh, such information analysis can be visualized in digital twin. Using such information analysis, we can you know, the simulate in the metaverse. Then the result can be fit to the you know, city uh, through the uh, AR and VR uh, platform. If the citizen has the wearable glasses, the citizen can fully utilize you know, the augmented city. As you can see, uh, nowadays high-speed network, uh, especially in Korea, SKT and KT provide pretty much you know, the fast net network between you know, the uh, device and nearing the edge and cloud. So uh, the XR glasses can provide just-in-time information for the user to make a smart decision. Such information sometimes processed in the glasses, sometimes processed in neighboring uh, edge and cloud. Everything can be done on the fly through the high-speed network. Through this process, citizen ability can be expanded in various ways. There are several possible uh, applications. Our daily life, our daily life, you know, the first of all, learning is pretty much important comp component. Working, playing, shopping, even the managing the city is, you know, the good example of the uh, uh, metaverse applications. Okay, so if what if we apply this this idea to the you know the new learning systems, we can build learning learning space on the metaverse. In in this space, there are there are no no boulders, no grades, no classes, no teachers in this new space. We just can connect and communicate and collaborate to learn new knowledge there, then we can apply the knowledge to solve the problems we encountered in uh, real, real world. There are several technical challenges. There are issues we have to solve. Uh, I will skip the explanation on the details. It can be applied to the many other areas, museums, concert, you know, park, gym, you know, those things also can be a good, you know, the application. Even, even we cannot go, go to the museum, still we can, you know, the enjoy the museum in the metaverse. Concert is the same. So this will drastically uh, change the whole life, the whole, our, our whole lives. 
it expands human's ability in various senses, especially we can expand the human's body ability. We can, you know, the, the basically metaverse you know, beyond the space and time. So we, we can move our body using the avatars. Also, we can support, you know, the uh, brain activities. The knowledge can be provided just in time to make a proper decision. Even, you know, the metaverse can help to connect the people so we can extend the social relationship ability of the humans. It transforms the way we live and interact with the world. Even it revolutionized industry in terms of the productivity, efficiency, and the safety. There are so many different applications. Still, there are several challenges. In order to make ecosystem, metaverse ecosystem, there are several key components, video avatars, content authoring, digital twin, AI, metaverse, extended reality platforms, wearable UI, networks, wearable devices, even industry ecosystem. Still, you know, you know, there are several issues we have to solve. I think you know, these three presenters already explained such technical issues. So the remaining question is, how can we make, how can we make uh, open sustainable reality virtuality convergence platform uh, that requires to provide a standardization of data, digital asset, uh, especially the Data expression is pretty much important for the internet talking. Internet talking is heterogeneous, you know, the platforms. It is another important issue for the uh, seamless XR experience. Another important, you know, issue is the economic activity. How can we connect online to offline, uh, bi-directional? economic activity, is it possible to change, you know, exchange the uh, digital asset across the uh, different platforms? Also, the data right is another important issue. Through uh, these complicated issues, we can build virtualized cities, and then we can make several different layers of metaverse. By applying uh, this kind of things, uh, uh, we can, uh, achieve, you know, the, we can experience a new, new ex we can experience, new, you know, the several different things in the metaverse. So uh, what are going to be happen in the augmented city? If we can realize that kind of things, we, we are living in physical space, we can make a digital twin, just copy a physical world to the digital world. Then we can do several different simulations there. Then what, what are going, what's, what's going to happen in the augmented city? First question is the, this kind of technology improves quality of life in, in the city. Are the citizens of the, of the city feel happy? So we have to think about how to make a balance between smart city and happy citizen. If we don't, consider such kind of issues, you know, the humans just use technologies and the machines learning, machine, you know, the getting smarter and smarter and smarter every day. So in order to make happy citizen, uh, we have to, we, we may need to change the metrics, evaluation metrics. In, in terms of the technology, in the viewpoint of technology, we always try to make efficient, you know, the efficient, we try to make efficiency, we try to improve the efficiency. We try to make useful solutions, usable solutions. However, such kind of solution may not be good for the human, human beings. Sometimes, inefficient solution needs to be selected for the human. Sometimes, you know, the inconvenient solution might be selected for the human. Sometimes, unintelligent suggestion might be needed for the human. You know, the, if 
if we include the human beings in the loop, the measurement should be different. So uh, we are developing you know, interesting technologies every day. The technology improves every day. Then why we, why we do the research? Why we do the development? Why we make better technologies? The ultimate goal is make people happy. In that viewpoint, we can use metaverse. You know, the we, we have to think about how how can we use metaverse for the human beings. So there are several challenges. We have to make us metaverse sustainable. Many people worry about the bubble, as I shown in the previous slide. You know, the more than uh, fifteen years ago in Korea, Korea government spent a lot of money on that direction. Uh, again. Uh, this year, Korea government planning uh, several research activities for next coming years. Then we have to learn from the previous history. We have to try to make a sustainable metaverse. In order to make a sustainable metaverse, we have to shift in thinking about the metaverse. Many people thought that metaverse is a you know, fun place, place for the games. This is good for the game. However, uh, we have to think about how, how can we make it useful for the human beings. For that, for, you know, the, in order to use metaverse for the human beings, we have to think about metaverse is you know, the uh, social platform, especially using the uh, reality virtuality convergence. This is also you know, the economy platform. We can do several interesting activity there. Also, uh, we can use metaverse for the problem solving test bed. As I explained, uh, the main mediation can be occurred on the digital twin. Digital twin is just a copy of physical world. Then by collecting the signal from the physical world, we can do several interesting simulation there. So if we, you know, the encounter any social issues, then we can simulate such issue in, in the metaverse. Many citizens can participate in the metaverse to, you know, to, to find out proper solutions. Also, in order to achieve such goals, we have to think about metaverse is a social overhead capital. So, uh, Government need to invest money for the uh, for that purpose. Government need to support innovation, build open ecosystem, and prepare the economic problem there. But still, you know the uh, remaining homeworks in this area. How can we make metaverse for social good? How can we make a sustainable? How can we make uh, people smile in that space? Uh, new challenge will. Uh, have mistake, a failure, and the setbacks. Even so, uh, those who never give up and take on the challenge change the world for the better. So, I hope, I hope we can take on the challenge together to build a new metaverse with a reality virtuality convergence platforms. Uh, this is it uh, for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wu, for your comprehensive lecture of current status and the future direction of the metaverse technology. Now, we will move into a discussion session with our four brilliant panelists. The audience that pre-registers for this webinar has left many interesting questions. Based on these questions, I have selected a few questions to be discussed. So let's move on to the first uh, question. I think Professor Byung-ho Lee uh, mentioned a little bit about this. Uh, our real world has become increasingly digitized during the COVID-19 pandemic. How has the pandemic changed the scope future of the metaverse business? And what are other important driving forces behind its sudden popularity and the growth? Yeah, uh, because you mentioned my name. So. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I, I saw in your slide and you mentioned yeah, yeah, about yeah. COVID-19. <laughs> okay, 
the, as you said, the current COVID-19 situation has uh, functioned as a kind of a catalyst of, uh, for rapid expansion of the uh, base of metaverse, I think. The tendency to seek uh, social interactions in the metaverse space has expanded as the number of real world meetings decreases. Uh, but another aspect is uh, that there exist many difficulties in the real world, especially under the current economic situation, while uh, people can do many things at will uh, in the virtual world in metaverse. Uh, besides the COVID-19 uh, situation, uh, I think there are other factors driving the popularity of metaverse. Uh, the strategy of a metaverse platform such as Roblox or Geppetto was good. Uh, there is no entrance barrier, so it is easy and uh, free to join. And their business model is also good. The users can create own avatars and decorate them with, uh, for example, Gucci costumes or accessories. And uh, the another example is that users can make their own uh, games on Roblox and uh, and others can use the, the games as well. And uh, there's another thing, uh, there is a tendency or a trend among young people uh, to uh, freely express their thoughts and indiv individuality uh, becomes very important. I think that kind of trend is also a driving force for the metaverse ecosystem and also technically uh, computer graphics power has improved significantly in recent years, which is also a very important factor, I think. Okay, thank you. And oh, Dr. Kass? Yeah, Please. I think that um, uh, COVID has certainly created a situation where it's more important than ever for people who are far away to be able to um, virtually be in the same place to work on the same uh, virtual designs, virtual um, assets, virtual items. And it becomes even more urgent for people to um, get their tools to work uh, seamlessly with each other across that distance. And so what we've tried to build with Omniverse is a way to, to integrate everything across those um, barriers by turning all the assets, all the representations into a common and open form. And so we have uh, had just an explosion of interest from um, all manner of different sectors of the economy and uh, uh, different organizations across uh, culture and, and um, uh, different, different purposes who want to work with each other um, in a, in a seamless way. And, and so we're trying to build that out as fast as we can. Uh, Dr. Lemmon, do you have some comments on that? Yeah, I, I certainly see the pandemic as what it is, which is a step change across many aspects of, of our society. But in this regard, in terms of sort of bringing about the metaverse earlier, right? There's, there's our professional lives, right? Where we present our work and we share we share the context of what we're doing with peers that really understand the context. But all of us know the truth of it is like when you have a holiday, you see your relatives and they ask you, hey, what do you do? And for many years, I've been working on AR and VR and I would tell the same story that one day this, this thing I put on my face will somehow let you live anywhere and be in a, in a workplace distributed across the entire globe, my relatives would always sort of roll their eyes and be like, you love science fiction. Yeah, maybe someday. But now with the pandemic, you know, those of us who are lucky enough to be able to work from home, you know, largely like tech workers and, and information workers, we have lived it now, right? And that, that probably would have taken a decade or more to come about naturally. Major companies are now allowing work from home where they would not have contemplated it before. And so we ran the experiment and largely it was successful, right? I can just from my small vantage point of leading a research team, we somehow made do, right? Even though we're hardware driven team, we actually worked effectively remotely. And, and now it's no longer this science fiction story. It's 
you actually get to the real part of it. We did the demo and now it's like, what, what are we missing right now, right? I'm missing a trip to Korea where I could meet everyone in person. I could see the amazing city and go to restaurants with you. And that part we can't replicate in a virtual reality headset, right? We can't, we can't recreate a full restaurant experience. There are things we can't do, but there, there are things we can now do and we all know it. And so I think in many ways it, it's convinced me like what I was saying is not just a good story. It, it does seem like the truth of perhaps this is a way we can reduce our carbon footprint. We don't need to be on planes as much. When it matters, we, we need to, but we can work productively remotely, which means we can open up economic opportunities to individuals that don't live in capital cities. I mean, much of what I tried to sell my relatives is coming true. And I think it did pull it in by a decade or more. You know, we'd still be talking about the metaverse for all the reasons Professor Lee mentioned, there, there are many factors of society moving that way, but, but the pandemic definitely accelerated the part I'm connected to. And it's perhaps one of the few silver linings to it is, is this tool is now being more actively developed than ever. Okay, you know, I, I think in, in yeah, fact, I also, oh yeah, the yeah. Professor Wu mentioned. Yeah, I also yeah. agree on the other's opinion. I, I also have similar you know, the opinion on that issues. Pandemic accelerated the you know, the widespread use of the metaverse in Korea. The more important thing, the more important, you know, the driving force might be the digital transformation technology mature. You know, the uh, hardware and software technology, you know, progress. And also new generation might be a big, uh, you know, the driving force. They are born in digital. They, they are, you know, pretty much familiar with, you know, the digital technologies. They, they are, good at using the smartphones. So they are, you know, currently, if we only focus on the game area, especially the Roblox or Fortnite, uh, Japan in Korea, you know, the teens are the main driving force. You know, 50s and 60s, they don't care about the Fortnite or Roblox. You know, the even, you know, the now, nowadays, you know, many 50 try to use, in, you know, Japan in Korea, but they just gave up pretty, pretty soon. Uh, you know, the generation gap is also, you know, big uh, driving force, you know, making the metaverse ubiquitous in Korea. Thank you. Uh, if, you if I can expand a little bit, then it seems like the metaverse is currently developing into a global business based on the, your uh, response. And what commercialization strategy should be combined with this platform business? And how do you envision the business model for the metaverse? So I think this one, maybe the Facebook has <laughs> some <laughs> business model for that. You can start. Uh, well, I, I don't presume to represent all of Facebook. I'm a display engineer. Uh, I can say personally for myself, right? Professor Lee mentioned several things I find interesting that are a very tiny, it, you know, it's like saying, what is the business model for the internet? I mean, it's a new platform. The metaverse is a, a 3D internet in some sense. Uh, and so we'll see an infinite number of businesses and the evolutions of the 2D versions we already have. But things that I think are interesting that Professor Lee mentioned that content creation has evolved. Small anecdote is one of my family traditions is I build a video game for my children every birthday. And the fact that I can do that as one individual and make an entire three to five hour video game over the course of many evenings, you know, that was not possible 20 years ago. And so the content creation tools are phenomenal. And some of the things we saw uh, Dr. Cass present that if we can really create the metaverse as, as we are sort of discussing, there is new business opportunity. It's again, this is a tiny little thing but I personally find it amazing that an artist could, could create an element that goes out across the metaverse and, and make a real living. And you know, just as someone who does make video games for a hobby, I now understand why you might pay 40 US dollars for a single model of a single chair. It's incredibly hard work that, that deserves recognition. And so this, this idea of sculpting, of artwork, having intrinsic value, I think we'll see, you know, this idea continued to evolve. And this is not even half a fraction of a percent of what the metaverse is, but it's something I'm excited about because I grew up playing with video games and to see this 
democratization where everyone is now a creator. The tools are so powerful. Even I, who am not a great artist, can create a whole universe and share it. This is exciting, especially when it becomes this shared experience across the entire globe. So again, that's not the Facebook you know, business answer. That's just my personal, what I want to see come about because I think it's fascinating. Okay, Dr. Kass, do you have any comments on that the business models or other side, the predictions? Yeah, um, so there, there are a lot of different um, business models potentially at work here. And, you know, what did we see with the internet explosion early on? It was that complete interoperability and connectivity and free flow of data uh, creates enormous value. And that value can be unlocked in, in a wide variety of different ways. So we think that's really the, the first thing is to standardize on the protocols, standardize on the inter interchange and make sure that that extends to as many um, domains as possible. And once that's the case, then um, if you have a service to provide and you connect into the open, omni uh, open uh, uh, metaverse, you've now connected in to everybody. You don't have to create a different version of that service for every possible user. Um, and that uh, just creates enormous uh, economic efficiencies. The other thing, um, and, and one of our uh, areas of focus is what well, uh, I think uh, um, both Professor Lee and Professor Wu have discussed, which is um, the idea of digital twins. We think that uh, that's gonna be transformative that you have a piece of infrastructure and you want to um, you know, understand where it's at simulated over its lifetime. In the past, you built a building, you may have used CAD tools for that. After it was built, you pr pretty much threw away the CAD model. But today, um, things are dynamic. You want to understand how that building is operating. What, for example, if it's a factory, it's gonna be reconfigured many times and you want to optimize the use of the factory. So all of those are, are done best in simulation and in a simulation that can um, bring together information from a wide variety of, of different sources. And uh, that's one of the, the big sort of motivations for building Omniverse and for creating these open standards for everybody to, to connect into. Uh, Professor Wu, uh, the Dr. Kast mentioned the digital twins and you talked about the digital twins and also the future of the metaverse. Do you have any comments on that, the business models? I actually have no idea about business model, because, but you know, the, the, in, in the viewpoint of mediation between uh, real physical world and virtual world, digital twin is good uh, platform to connect in both worlds. If we consider the metaverse as platform, platform itself, I, I think that is a business model like uh, Facebook or YouTube. Many people will, will get together and then there, will, there might be several, you know, the similar activity there. That, you know, metaverse itself might be big uh, business model. That is my guess. Okay, thank you. Professor Lee, do you have any comments on that? Uh, yeah. uh, because the metaverse is an ecosystem, uh, I think the hurdles of accessibility should be low. So uh, with the most current metaverse platforms, a strategy to expand the base for users by providing a free platform seems to be a good strategy. And in addition, probably it is necessary to operate the server workstation by taking a small percentage of uh, fee uh, from the user's uh, internet content purchase uh, in Metaverse. And by developing and releasing VR, AR devices uh, with various specifications, uh, like the smartphones, various models of smartphones, the hardware companies might, uh, might I mean, uh, uh, guess um, uh, the, the uh, success in commercializing the devices. And the uh, monetizing strategy like the case of Decentraland is also very interesting. Actually, they limit the total area in the virtual land. 
which is divided in sections and sold in virtual space. And the prices vary. Uh, maybe taxes in virtual estate might be a sustainable business model if the virtual world is really uh, interesting to the users to keep their wealth uh, or digital asset in the metaverse space. Thank you. Uh, for clever business, actually, uh, one area of debate is whether a true metaverse can have a single operator or requires a heavily decentralized platform built upon community-based standards and protocols. How do you foresee the interoperability of the metaverse? And uh, if in the case, how plausible will it be to establish industry-wide standards around the topic such as data security, data persistence, and uh, forward compatible code evolution? Maybe Dr. Kass, do you have any comments? It's a kind of standard in the future for in the metaverse area? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, we, we know that um, there are a lot of uh, players that have an interest in creating walled gardens and trying to meet everybody's needs and keep them inside. Uh, but, you know, as we've seen from the web, there's tremendous value in um, getting to a situation where, where everything can talk to everything else. And we think that value is so large that it's inevitable that it will happen. And we're doing our best to support it. So we've taken um, a standard that exists, open source, uh, Pixar's USD. We've open sourced additional pieces that we think are critical to um, making that all work. We've tried to make sure that, the, um, uh, that there are nice protocols for updating those uh, models in real time. We're making it available to individuals for free to try out and do whatever they want with it. And, um, you know, we're uh, convinced that people who, who understand that this is not a walled garden, who uh, can see that the basic, all the basic data uh, formats and protocols are open, will be willing to invest in it because they're not worried that somebody is gonna uh, come along and and uh, charge a very large tax on it. And um, as, a, as a result, we think that's, that's the way forward. And we, we invite other large players to come and join us in looking at what needs to be added to this ecosystem so that it can have even, even wider applicability. But uh, absolutely, the, our view is that the, the metaverse itself is far too big for anybody to own, for any one player to own. Um, there will be specialized metaverses probably that have their own proprietary standards, but our greatest interest is in one uh, based around open standards and uh, we're doing everything we can to, to push that forward. Okay, thank you. Any comments from the experts about the standardization for the technology? Yeah, I have a comment. Uh, it would be good. Uh, it would be good uh, to think of uh, the current smartphone uh, smartphone case. Uh, in the case of Apple, uh, it has built its own operating system that is compatible only with its own mobile phones. But uh, Google's Android has created a platform that is compatible with smartphones of various companies uh, with an open strategy. So the Meta verse uh, platform needs to be uh, follow a similar model of, of Android. Uh, image rendering programs such as uh, physically based rendering are important in developing a, a, a realistic metaverse platforms. In the case of uh, image engines, uh, there are several representative engines that are uh, widely used worldwide such as uh, Unity and Unreal Engine and they adopt an open strategy similar to Android and the difficulty of creating virtual environment is uh, alleviate, alleviated uh, and the quality is improving. So, and we saw very impressive, uh, I mean, uh, 
demonstrations of uh, USD in uh, Dr. Kass talk. And so uh, there is, uh, so uh, it is expected that more users will use uh, those kind of engines. And since most AR, VR devices are already compatible with this kind of engine, uh, the setting standards for security or compatibility uh, shouldn't be difficult, I think. And uh, platforms with unique compatibility standards, uh, such as Apple, may, may also emerge. But for that kind of case, uh, platform development companies need to, be, needs to establish uh, precise standards themselves, I think. Thank you. Uh, if I can change gear a little bit to toward the general public, uh, I also use movie clip for my presentation. Whenever I uh, explain the paradigm shift of a wearable device from accessory type to textile and also body attachable, stretchable wearable devices, etc., it seems like it takes about thirty years when you actually see the technology in our real life based on the Hollywood movie. So the general public's most common conceptions of the metaverse stem from science fiction, right? Such as the virtual worlds portrayed in Ready Player One and the Matrix. So how will our future maybe ultimate form of metaverse compared to these fantastical visions captured by science fiction authors? I, thought, I saw the professor Wu mentioned about red or green pills, right? I don't know at this moment, which one should I take? But can you have a comment on that? The extreme ultimate form of metaverse in the future? In my viewpoint, you know, the, nowadays the, there is no common uh, definition of metaverse. Each one has a different definition of metaverse. In my viewpoint, the more important thing, originally metaverse comes from the virtual world, but the the more important thing is using such information or knowledge or experience in the physical space. So uh, as long as we use the, uh, such, such information or knowledge in physical space, uh, that may not be the same as the movie. Uh, my, my, my main interest is how we make you know, this such new space in the physical space, not the virtual space itself. So I hope we can use in everyday life, uh, in, in daily life, you know, the, there are so many things we can be, you know, the sportive using the metaverse. We can simulate and, and then, you know, the, uh, you can use such result on the fly in the in physical space, then makes a new opportunity in physical space. So uh, near physical world, world might be more fun and, you know, the interesting places when it compared to the virtual. Virtual, even if we make you know, virtual realistic, still that's a virtual. So uh, I hope we can make you know, the, such fun, uh, fun thing in real physical space. What do you think the NVIDIA? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think that um, uh, obviously Hollywood is drawn by um, good storytelling. So whatever makes a compelling story, Whatever's going to tell tickets, sell tickets, that's that's what Hollywood wants to um, present. I think um, if you look back at the early days of the internet, all of a sudden all these computers were being connected around the world. And what did Hollywood give us? They gave us a prediction of computers taking over, um, launching missiles, and all kinds of doomsday scenarios. And and what they didn't tell us is is the very ordinary things that started to happen, like the fact that you can now buy airplane tickets by yourself very easily. And so there's been a disruption in um, travel agents, for example. And, you know, that's just one of, of thousands of examples of ways in which the connectivity of the internet has, has changed how we do business. And I think that when three-dimensional worlds are shared widely, all of a sudden we're going to find thousands of new opportunities that nobody can predict right now where people start to work more effectively together and um, things get built. I think it's, it's going to revolutionize architecture. You're going to be able to go from 
conceptual design through real simulation to figure out what you're, you're actually going to get. I mean, you see now where uh, furniture companies are starting to help you visualize the furniture in your own home, but eventually that's going to be a full metaverse activity. So you're going to walk into this virtual world that's going to include your home and, and, you're going to, and a decorator is going to help you uh, lay things out and it's going to be a full 3D experience and it's going to be much more convenient, much uh, easier than it, than it is today. And it's going to uh, change the whole way that we do interior decorating that we, um, and, and the way that we build architecture and the way we plan cities and the way we um, navigate and simulate uh, potential uh, ways to, to um, get all kinds of things done. So I'm, I'm not so concerned about uh, the science fiction novels and the, um, and the Hollywood movies that portray gloom and doom because uh, you know, that, that's their job. I think it's, it's gonna be immensely practical and we're seeing uh, our manufacturing partners tell us how much it's gonna help them to be able to do everything in simulation um, before they spend the money to make a mistake. And those efficiencies, that's gonna benefit everybody. All of a sudden, um, we're gonna uh, be able to reduce the cost of all, all kinds of goods and services. So I, I'm, I'm very excited about uh, a metaverse-based future uh, and a digital world. Thank you. Doc, you have any comment? <laughs> yeah, so, so yes, I mean, it used to be, uh, at least when I joined Oculus, still a startup, everyone got a copy of, of Ready Player One, and, and we like to read these things. And many of us grew up reading science fiction. So going, going to your question of which things may they get right or wrong, I mean, step away from the dystopia and the societal things. I, I'm a hardware driven person. So looking at the hardware, I think Ready Player One is the most mundane, but probably the most accurate in the sense that Ready Player Two, the matrix, they both assume beyond the ultimate display I talked about, which is a brain machine interface and, and an invasive one at that in the matrix. And th th this sort of idea that you could replace Ivan Sutherland's instrumented room with a direct neural interface is correct. We are just brains in a box. That's obviously, I think, nowhere on the horizon in our lifetimes. And so if you go to the boring old Ready Player One, you have headsets, which we have today. You have limited haptics, maybe a suit if you're really into like extreme haptics. Uh, I think they, they sort of got that arc. You know, you mentioned it being 20 years my friend Mary Lou Jepson says the same. Any new idea in the display industry, it's usually 20 years from the first paper to seeing a consumer product. And so I think that's where Ready Player One perhaps did get it right, that we already have most of the things written in there. And the metaverse we've been talking about is pretty well imagined in, in there. I mean, it's geared heavily towards gaming and education. But I think that's actually a reasonable view of where things could easily get within 10 years. Ready Player Two, not so much. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Professor Lee, you have some comments? Yeah. So actually the current popular meta service platforms uh, like Jepeto or Roblox or Decentraland are quite different from the meta service shown uh, in the movie of Ready Player One. In the movie of Ready Player One, they use uh, uh, head mount displays and ear earphones. But uh, for the current popular uh, meta service platforms, we do not use such devices yet. So I think finally we have to go to that direction of using uh, headset devices because uh, uh, more vivid interaction is needed. So the first, it is essential to have uh, a uh, ultra high resolution display devices to provide uh, uh, the very high quality and wide viewing 3D depth images, uh, which could be as natural as the real world. And uh, when it is accompanied by advanced sensor technology and tracking technology, uh, they can interact naturally in the uh, virtual world. Uh, for example, in the movie of Ready Player One, uh, when the main character of the movie shakes hands with other characters uh, in the metaverse, uh, he can feel as real 
uh, through sensors and stimuli, which allows the metaverse to be like an uh, immersive real world. So uh, currently display sensor and tracking technologies all for uh, short of the ideal technology shown in the science fiction, but a lot of research is being done. So I think it will be possible to produce such a vivid metaverse uh, in, in the not so far future. Okay, uh, this is gonna be the last quick question. You know, the general public sees a lot of, you know, the emerging technology in the metaverse area. Uh, you guys are really the expert in this field. How long do you think it takes before general public really feels that oh, metaverse is here in our real life? In terms of you know, the, you mentioned about a lot of challenges in the hardware, AR, VR headset, and probably com computational, uh, the the abilities, and also the communications performance, right? So. Please just take turns and your vision, how long does it take? When you know, you know that I feel, you know, I'm the not the expert in this area. I feel all oh, metaverse is here around us. Okay, maybe start with Doug. It's, it's an interesting question because uh, you know, there's that famous saying, you know, however long you predict, it's <laughs> always twice as long. Uh, in some sense, it's been here my whole life in, in many ways, right? It, it's in kind, it's here, and it's just degrees we're talking about, right? I grew up with a Nintendo Entertainment System, and that that brought a shared but not simultaneously distributed virtual environment to me, and that you know that evolved into local area network gaming like Doom and Quake, and that that kept evolving into the massive worlds of Warcraft and and Fortnite and Minecraft and what have you. And so, I guess I'd argue we don't have to wait in that sense, right? And AR VR is just the most immersive way. And it, I do think it does something special, which is it achieves presence. I don't, I don't think you can do that with other devices, uh, but it's already here. The metaverse has been here for quite a while and it's, it's in that fragmented form of piecewise walled gardens, but it's here. Uh, and, and I think we'll just see it continue every year to just sort of evolve the same way, you know, home, home entertainment, like the Nintendo entertainment system, right? It's a direct line to today's consoles. It, they, didn't, they didn't have a step change at any point. And I don't think the metaverse really will have a step change. I think AR and VR is the same, right? You can get a headset today, you can put it on and you can see three-dimensional graphics better than you've ever seen. And in some sense, you know, the things we talk about, especially Dr. Lee and I, the technical challenges while important, you know, we're steadily moving forward. And so that, I don't think there'll be one day where we magically cross the line and say, oh, this is the metaverse. We may in fact look back and say, oh, this obscure video game evolved into the metaverse or how it actually comes about, especially the most prominent widely used one will be a unique and interesting story that probably hasn't started yet. But I guess my answer is it's already been here for quite a while. Hey, thank you. Professor Wu? Uh, considering the hardware platform experiencing the metaverse, uh, the glass might be the good one to, to experience the metaverse. Considering the VR glasses, the Facebook Oculus Quest 2 make a big success nowadays. Uh, Samsung made a vibe. Uh, I'm waiting the Apple's, Apple's glass. That might be a, appear uh, sometime next year. The more important thing is the AR glasses. Uh, when the AR glass make a big success, that is real, really the time for the metaverse, I think. Okay, thank you. Professor Lee? Yeah, uh, I think uh, it depends on the, the activities of NVIDIA and Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so I'm an optics person, so let me talk about the VR, AR uh, class devices. So uh, demand for VR, AR devices has been steadily increasing from the past and I think the need for AR, VR devices will increase significantly as contents become more diverse uh, within the metaverse uh, platform. 
Uh, however, the reason why the current uh, penetration rate of AR VR headset is not high is that there are uh, many, many hurdles yet, uh, such as high price, big size, and weight of the device, as uh, Doug and I explained. Uh, but uh, there are lots of efforts going on in this field. Uh, VR AR headset devices are rapidly developing. Facebook acquired the uh, Oculus uh, a, a, in 2014 and launched the, the VR platform Horizon a service in 2019. And within the company, the Facebook Reality Labs, uh, which researches VR AR devices, is investing a lot of money and manpower in research, I think. And Microsoft introduced its own augmented reality head mount displays, HoloLens, and its upgrade version, HoloLens 2, and collaborate with companies in various fields. Apple is also invest investing uh, a lot of uh, money in, on the development of AR, VR, new eye display devices. So improvements in the performance, weight, and price of uh, AR, VR devices uh, through investments uh, by such big IT companies uh, can speed up the popularization of the metaverse uh, to the general public, although I cannot tell when it would be, yeah. Okay, thank you. Dr. Kass? Yeah, so I mean, I totally agree with what um, Dr. Lemon said that, um, you know, the metaverse has been around in some sense, in some very limited sense for a very long time. But I don't think that's um, <clears throat> the point at which it really impacts uh, our society in a big way. And I'll take this measure, which is, you know, um, today, at least in the United States, to be a functioning, a fully functioning member of society, you basically need to be able to access uh, the web. Uh, it, for example, let's say all you want to do is schedule a COVID shot in the U.S. Well, the way you interact with the world, the way you make that happen is, is with the 2D web. And I'm not so concerned with exactly what devices we use to interact with our virtual worlds for some people it's going to be um, traditional screens because they just don't want to put anything on their heads. Um, for some people, they're going to dive into VR headsets. For other people, it's going to be AR. But the transformation to me that's key is when everybody starts to build 3D representations of whatever it is that's important to them. And that those 3D representations are all tied together with a common infrastructure. And that I think is going to start to happen probably, you know, within five years, it's going to be pretty widespread by 10 years. I think it's going to be everywhere that no matter what it is, you're going to have, you're going to be in the 3D business right now, whatever it is that you do, uh, you probably need to have a website and it's a 2D website. There's a future where whatever it is that you do, it needs to be part of the metaverse. Will that, be, will that transformation be finished by 10 years? Probably not. But will it be really on its way to the point where um, your, your ability to function in society is, is almost requiring the ability to enter the metaverse uh, at various times to just get things done? And I, I don't think that's very far away. Point when everybody is putting on VR devices and everybody's um, you know, using these these special display technologies, that may be further along. But I think we're, we're entering um, uh, a, real, a real inflection point. And you're gonna see the foundations for the 3D representations of, of everything in a connected way coming very, very soon. And it's going to, um, the adoption is gonna be very, very quick, I believe. Thank you. I feel like I should play more games should watch more movies and should more pay more attention to what's happening around me after today's seminar. Okay, uh, to conclude today's webinar, uh, I'd like to thank our speakers again for their engagement and condor. And thank you to our audience tuning in online. I hope that today's webinar clarified the curiosities you have about the emerging metaverse platform 
and we hope to see you again in our upcoming scientific innovation series. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. You did an excellent job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.